and now we're moving into the final section of Unit 8, and that is on intelligence. We've talked a lot about problem solving and decision making and language, and all those skills roll into this idea of intelligence. But what is intelligence anyway? Despite us studying it for over a century, we're still not exactly sure, but we have some ideas. Intelligence might be the idea of someone who knows a lot of things. Maybe someone who's good at problem solving, someone who's a quick learner and can adapt and learn things quicker. Or maybe someone who overachieves and demonstrates their ability better. But we're not sure. Now the study of intelligence has really taken on two flavors. There's the more theoretical end of intelligence where people theorize what to be intelligent means. And then there's the more empirical quantitative testing of intelligence where we sort of sort it out. We're going to jump into the theoretical side first in the history of intelligence. So the history of intelligence is pretty varied. We've had lots of discussions in the history of psychology trying to figure out what do we mean by intelligence? One of the very early voices about this was Francis Galton. He's Charles Darwin's cousin, and he believed that intelligence was the skill that ran through families that we could find in family trees that was related to things like reaction time. In fact, he used to make up some old school carnival games where he'd get people to test out their reaction time and also took down their family history and tested the connections between family members. So he believed that intelligence was largely biologically driven and it was something we could inherit. Moving a little bit further, uh, we have the debate by Charles Spearman and Lewis Thurston. So Charles Spearman believed that intelligence was something that was general. If you were good at one thing, you're probably good at lots of things. Those that can have faster reaction time are probably better at reading, are probably better at math, are probably better, better at logical problems, let's say. Versus Lewis Thurston believed that there could be lots of different subtypes of intelligence and we might only be good at some of them. It's possible someone who's really good at reading is not so good at math, or someone who's good at math is not so good at memorizing things, and that there could be lots of differences. But Charles Spearman believed that there was this general intelligence that he liked to call his G factor, versus Thurston believed there would be more specific traits. Moving on again into the future a little bit is the work by Raymond Cattell. And Raymond Cattell wasn't really interested in the traits or what you could do with intelligence, but he believed there was two types, crystallized and fluid. In short, he believed that crystallized intelligence was the stuff you already know, the facts, the semantic trivial knowledge you already know, and whether you can apply it. Yeah, you might have read lots of books, but how well can you apply what you learned in those books? That's our crystallized knowledge. Versus our fluid knowledge was how quickly can you learn new information? If you're in a completely novel situation with new stuff that you've never encountered before, how quickly can you adapt? And Cattell believed that was your fluid intelligence. So crystallize is what you can do with what you already have, and fluid is how fast can you learn in the future. Moving on from Gattel's version of two intelligence, we have Robert Sternberg's idea of three main types of intelligence. Sternberg believed that when we talk about intelligence, we're usually talking about analytical book smarts. That is, people who are good at reading, writing, arithmetic, all that sort of stuff, and the type of people that excel in school. He believed that analytical intelligence is this convergent intelligence, when you're trying to come up with lots of possibilities to get the one right answer. In addition to this, he really proposed the importance of creativity or divergent intelligence. This is the ability to come up with lots of different possibilities. It's like when we talked about mental set and functional fixedness. If we give someone a brick, how many different possibilities can they come up with? And one of the tests of creativity is when you give a child a piece of paper that has lots of just black circles on a white background drawn and ask the child to come up with as many possible things those circles could be. Could one be a pumpkin? Could you make two circles side by side become a bicycle or a pair of sunglasses? How many different possibilities can you make? And that would be divergent creativity. And he believed that was also very important. But in addition to those two, Sternberg also argued for the importance of practical knowledge. This wasn't book smarts, and this wasn't creative outside the thinking. This was more social skills, social norms, understanding how the world works. It's the idea if you missed your bus, what do you have to do to get home? If you're stranded on a desert island, what's the first thing you should do? So very different from just trying to solve math problems or trying to solve literacy problems. Now, three intelligences seems like heavy. We'll wait till I introduce you to Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligence. 
This theory started off with 7 and then 8, and now some sources say there's a 9 added, but I like to stick with the 8 model. And so what Gardner believes makes these different intelligences different is there are different ways individuals can solve genuine real-life problems, and they all represent ways that our central nervous system can be superior and can be stronger in certain aptitudes. So starting from the top and moving clockwise, he believed one type of intelligence was our linguistic intelligence. The ability to solve anagrams or make poetry or wordsmith lyrics for a song or understand really intricate prose is linguistic intelligence. The second type is what he called logical or mathematical intelligence. And it's not just arithmetic, but also geometry or algebra or statistics, logical problem solving. So this could be analogies as well. The third type is what he called naturalistic intelligence. And this is not so much about finding the patterns in nature, but more so if you're out in nature, are you sensitive to the intricacies? If you're hiking in the woods, what do you have to pay attention to? Do you have that intuitive connection to nature? Do you understand the connectivity of the natural realm and understand your place in it? If you're at the beach, do you understand how the seashells are connected to the ocean without having to read about that in a book? That one's a little bit harder for me to grasp, but it's also been said that that type of intelligence may have come from non-Western ways of thinking. And so that might be harder for us growing up in Westernized societies to really appreciate. This fourth type of intelligence, often called spatial intelligence, is whether you can rotate blocks if you're playing with Legos or building in Minecraft. It's the idea, can you visualize a room to build a building or conduct interior decorating? Or can you draw in a way that it represents depth? and make an understanding of how the spatial cues can work together. So understanding places and our, the world within those different places. Number five is what he called musical intelligence. Not just being sensitive to pitch, but definitely being sensitive to pitch, but also rhythm and tempo and understanding how to compose a beautiful piece of music or understanding how to appreciate a beautiful piece of music and being able to articulate the differences. The next one is what he called kinesthetic intelligence, and this is the ability to move your body, whether through ballet or martial arts. It's the ability that you understand coordination and balance in a superior way. We can even think about sprinters like Hussein Bolt and the idea that yes, there is my muscle fibers and yes, there is cardiovascular issues that help a sprinter or a runner. But there's also cognitive issues, the ability to actually make the neurons fire fast enough to make someone move their legs fast enough is a cognitive ability. Then we have two that are much more social, and these are inter and intrapersonal intelligence. Interpersonal intelligence is the idea that you understand relationships, you understand social norms, you understand other people's feelings, you understand how to motivate people. You can be a good friend, a good coach, and a good teacher. And the last one is what he called intrapersonal, and this is one's ability to understand themselves, to self-reflect, to understand their own emotions, their own strengths, and their own weaknesses. So keep in mind that Gardner's theory is a theory. It doesn't hold up so well when we test it empirically, but it is still a well-respected theory in the field for helping us to understand how these different skills could be to be connected to different real life problems. Now, aside from Howard Gardner, there's also the movement towards emotional intelligence. This doesn't have one big name behind it, but multiple names behind it. And this is the idea that in addition to analytical intelligence or solving IQ tests, it's also important to have good social skills. It's also important to have good self-esteem and resiliency. And in developmental psychology, the area with I work in, in the last five years, the notion of social emotional learning has taken off to the point now where many highly regarded scholars in Canada are pushing for a national plan for social emotional learning in elementary and middle school. This is just as important for our development as literacy and numeracy. This is the idea about how to health, have healthy relationships, how to regulate stress, how to understand oneself. So there's lots of different theories about intelligence. I like to post this little graphic to kind of explain that Spearman's general G was this more analytical type of intelligence mapped onto Sternberg's analytical, to both Cattell's fluid and crystallized, and to Gardner's linguistic and logical or math intelligence. Then we have Sternberg's creativity, which maps on with Gardner's spatial movement or kinesthetic and musical ability. And finally, we have Sternberg's practical or pragmatic intelligence, mapping on also with emotional intelligence and Gardner's intra, inter and intrapersonal intelligence. So lots of intelligence going on, and that's just the theoretical side.